We began our tour at the El Olivar Hotel, overlooking a peaceful park in the San Isidro district of Lima. After an 18 hour flight it was good to be able to stretch our legs as we wandered amongst the ancient olive trees, looking at the exotic flowers. This part of Lima is easy to explore on foot. It's a smart residential area and the Avenida Aratipa houses several embassies. Much of the architecture reflects the country's Spanish colonial past. The busy square of San Isidro is a good place for bus spotting. We were picked up by Carmen, our city guide, who first took us to a street vendor to sample a drink made from black sweet corn and a delicious crispy thing dripping with honey. The tourist police are a visible friendly presence in the Plaza San Martin, the second biggest square in downtown Lima, which was built after independence. Once one of the most fashionable areas, it's now a haven for pickpockets. When the San Martin monument was ordered, it was specified that it should contain a woman with a flame of victory on her head. The Spanish word for flame is llama, and the Peruvian sculptor took the wrong meaning and put a llama on her head. The massive downtown post office has an open roof. Carmen then took us down the narrow streets to look round a typical old colonial house. Within a colonnaded walkway, colourful murals decorate what would otherwise be blank walls. Real plants enhance the effect. At the end of the colonnade is the Plaza de Armas, the cultural and political heart of the city and the oldest part of Lima. Here stand the government palace and the cathedral, as well as luxury apartments. The Bishop's Palace shows a strong Moorish influence in its balconies. The cathedral has been destroyed at least twice by earthquakes. Nearby is the Palace of Justice. The flower market sells arrangements for all occasions. The tour finished in Barranco, Lima's most picturesque district. Next day we took the early morning flight to Arequipa, 7,700 feet up into the Andes. After collecting our luggage, we checked into the El Cabildo Hotel, situated in a quiet residential area. Angela, our guide for the next four days, took us on a city tour, stopping first to see a herd of llama and alpaca. From the viewpoint, we looked across the Chile River to Mount Chichero, El Misti Volcano and Pichu Pichu. The original pre-Incan terraces are still worked today. At the viewpoint is a small botanic garden and lots of little insects which bite your ankles. 
It was then a short trip across the maize fields to the city centre, where we visited the Santa Catalina convent, which was founded in 1579. Traditionally, the second daughter of the family was sent to be a nun. Once accepted into the convent, they never met their family face to face again. The only contact was through a grid in the wall and a hatch through which gifts could be passed. In the laundry area, water was diverted to individual basins simply by blocking the main channel. There was a three-class system of nuns, Europeans being upper class, mixed race middle class and native Peruvians very much lower class. Many of the wealthier nuns had servants and their own individual houses. The convent generated numerous scandals. There were parties, smuggled male visitors and lavish lifestyles. A crackdown in the 19th century brought all this to an end and the nuns were obliged to live in large dormitories, nowadays used as an art gallery. Outside the convent all is hustle and bustle heading down the smart colonial street to the main square, again called the Plaza de Amas, where the pigeons were flocking in the evening light. <laughs> At the top of the square is the cathedral, which was badly damaged by earthquake in June 2001 when the West Tower crashed through the roof. We left Arequipa the following morning, heading higher into the Andes. Having stopped at a viewpoint over farmland, we next came to the Pampa de Arieros, where we saw small herds of vicuñas, the wild relatives of the llama and alpaca. At the rock forest, we stopped for refreshments and shopping. Here we turned off the main road and headed into the Reserva Nacional Salina Ciaguada Blanca, crossing wetlands populated by Andean wildfowl. We stopped for a short while in the crater of an extinct volcano, where the sun had not yet melted the icicles. More stallholders had set up shop at the highest point of the road, a breath-stopping 16,100 feet, where travellers had built piles of stones called apachetas as offerings to the gods. The road then descended slowly into farmland. Here we found mixed herds of llama and alpaca, Children took advantage of the cuteness of the young animals and themselves to pose for photographs and make a bob or two. Down in the valley is the town of Chivai. Although I say down, the town stands at 11,800 feet. Just outside the town are hot springs where weary travellers and locals alike can soak in the medicinal waters. The nearby museum has a display of costumes from the lower and upper Colca valleys.
We stayed at the Casa Andina Lodge in a small bungalow. At this height it's a good idea to drink coca tea to ward off the effects of altitude sickness and it's available free in all the hotels. We set off early into the Colca Canyon which is twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. We had come to see the condors. These magnificent birds stand one meter high and have a wingspan of three meters. The adults are black with white markings, whilst the juveniles are brown. The guidebook said we would be extremely lucky to get a decent photograph. So much for guidebooks. Higher in the valley are small towns accessible only on foot. More stalls at the side of the road and more people posing for photographs, although these two ladies were both a hundred years old. The views over the valley are stunning and clearly show the terraces laid out by the Incas centuries ago. At Mecca there is a very attractive church, which is sumptuously decorated inside. Outside is an eagle, which was found injured and now makes its living, along with so many others, posing for photographs.
All too soon it was time to leave the Kolka and make our way across the Altiplano, the high barren plateau which extends for hundreds of miles across Peru and Bolivia. Puno on the shores of Lake Titicaca, which at 12,500 feet is the highest navigable lake in the world. Here we stayed at the Senesta Pasada del Inca, right on the lake edge. In the Atel grounds were examples of what we were to see later on the lake. Here, despite consuming numerous cups of coca tea and coca sweets, altitude sickness struck and we both got severe headaches. Moored at the end of the Atel jetty is the steamship Yavari, one of the oldest ships afloat. Built in Britain, she was carried across the Andes in 1,383 pieces using mules and manpower. This took six years. She was launched on Titicaca in 1870. In the 1970s, when she was unused and deteriorating, she was bought by an English enthusiast and is now being restored. The hull and engines are complete and it's hoped she will eventually offer cruisers on the lake. Guided tours are free, but sales of souvenirs and t-shirts help finance the restoration. A 45 minute drive from Puno is Silastani in an area once inhabited by the mighty Kola people, whose armies once fought the Incas. Standing on the hillside overlooking a small lake are several chulpas, burial towers for Kola royalty. A boat arrived to take us out onto Lake Titicaca. It's South America's largest lake, being 108 miles long and up to 40 miles wide and forms part of the border between Peru and Bolivia. Puno stands on the edge of a shallow bay which forms only a small part of the lake and is rich in birds, fish and plant life. Our destination was the Euros Islands, a group of floating islands, each one occupied by a single extended family. We were welcomed with music and dancing. The islands are made of totora reeds, as are all the structures on them. As the reeds slowly decay from below, they have to be replaced from the top. This is carried out every two weeks or so. The soggy decaying reeds are only a few inches below the surface of the island. Food is cooked over open fires and the diet consists mainly of guinea pigs, which they breed themselves, and fish, which they catch in the lake. The islanders are among the last practitioners of the art of reed boat making, and this is where Thor Heyerdahl learned to build his ship, Ra. For a couple of pounds donation to the school fund, we were treated to a ride on a reed boat. Getting aboard was a bit tricky, but after that it proved a very calm, relaxing experience. The original Euros people were nomads who were not made welcome and were squeezed out onto the lake where they were forced to fish and hunt waterfowl among the reeds. This they still do and barter their catch for anything else they need. They sell handicrafts to tourists and the money from this goes towards the school. At dawn the loco arrived to take us from Puno to Cusco on the Andean Explorer, one of the great railway journeys of the world. We travelled first class with an open observation car and entertainment all the way.
The included lunch was served as we crossed the Altiplano. Halfway through the journey, we stopped to allow the train travelling in the opposite direction to pass. Here, the locals took the opportunity to make money by selling souvenirs and posing for photos. We stopped at the highest point on the line to take photographs and, of course, buy more souvenirs. In the early evening, ten hours after leaving Puno, the train pulled into Cusco. The heart of Cusco is the elegant Plaza de Armas, which was once the site of the Incas' solemn public ceremonies, and later the executions of Incas who resisted the Spaniards. Along one side of the square is the magnificent cathedral. Begun in 1550, it took a hundred years to complete. In front of the cathedral is an ornate fountain. On another two and a half sides are shady arcades with shops on the ground floor and restaurants with ornate balconies above. On the remaining half side is the Jesuit church of La Campania. On a street off the main square is the church of La Merced, and opposite was our hotel, the Casa Andina. Nearby is the Plaza Regocio. Near the main square is a maze of narrow alleys, lined with colonial houses with the most beautiful balconies. Though they may look small, Within the houses are large courtyards, now occupied by souvenir stores. Many of today's buildings have been built on top of the old Inca walls, and here on Loreto is the longest Inca wall in existence. At one end of the town, the narrow streets become very steep. Off these are even smaller alleys containing restaurants. At the top of the town is the area of San Blas. In the centre of the district is a small square where local artists and craftsmen gather every day to sell their wares. Some are quite unusual such as these jigsaws, which are exact copies of sections of Inca wall. At the bottom of the hill is the actual wall copied for the jigsaws. Anna Marie, our Cusco guide, 
took us to a hill just above the city to see the ruins of Sacsayhuaman. This was the ultimate display of Inca engineering prowess. Its largest blocks weigh hundreds of tons, yet they are perfectly fitted together to form three zigzag tiers. Sacsayhuaman was a temple, administrative centre and storehouse. Within the walls once stood many buildings, but everything was demolished and taken away to build the Spanish Cusco. The circular building is thought to have been a water tower. A short drive away are the recently restored irrigated terraces of Tipon. Entering via a ritual four-channel waterfall leading to a public shower, the water has already travelled through six miles of aqueduct to get here. Water flows from terrace to terrace and each can be irrigated by blocking the channel in the same way as the laundry at Catalina Convent. Ruined buildings and granaries stand beside the terraces. Being recently restored, Tipon has not yet found its way onto the main tourist circuit and therefore was very quiet. The following day, Anna Marie took us to the Sacred Valley. By this time we'd bought enough hats, ponchos and dolls to last a lifetime, so these ladies were out of luck. The road crossed fertile land, which is farmed as a cooperative. We descended into Urubamba and on to Ayantaytambo. Here the Urubamba Valley has been sculpted into an impressive complex of irrigated agricultural terraces which still work 500 years later. The lower stonework is comparatively crude. Large carved stones in the valley floor have been toppled from the palace at the top by the conquering Spaniards. From the terraces is a good view of the granaries built on the steep hillside opposite and of the town which follows the original Inca town plan. As we climbed the terraces we noticed that the quality of the stonework improved the higher we went. It's thought that the lugs on the stones were to attach lifting straps and would have been trimmed off later except that the work was never completed because of the Spanish invasion. The terraces have different microclimates, so different crops could grow on different levels. Potatoes on the top, sweet corn in the middle and coca at the bottom. The stone for the terraces was quarried from the far hillside and dragged across the valley floor. In the town, the houses are built on the Inca ruins, but one Inca house survives intact. It's built around a small courtyard, and the guinea pigs live inside with the family. We had lunch at UK at the Sinesta Posada del Inca Hotel, where they used an alpaca as a lawnmower. Then we drove down the Urubamba Valley to the market at Pisac. Here, in addition to the usual souvenirs, many stalls were selling silver jewellery. One stall sold vegetable dyes and another all kinds and colours of sweet corn. Colourful dancers met us on the station next morning as we went to join the Hiram Bingham train. 
This luxury train operated by Orient Express has a dining car, club car, kitchen car and just 11 passengers. On its three and a quarter hour journey it travels down the Urubamba Valley beyond the end of the road where it follows the sacred river through steep sided gorges. The line follows the route of the Inca Trail, along which hikers, supported by their teams of porters, make the four-day journey to Machu Picchu. After a gourmet lunch, we too arrived at Machu Picchu Pueblo, often mistakenly called Aguas Calientes, the twin town of Haworth in Yorkshire. On leaving the train, most passengers run the gauntlet of the tourist market to get to the bus station. We, however, went into the square of this pretty little town in order to deliver letters from the children of Haworth to the local school. In front of the school stands a statue of an Inca warrior. We then made our way to the bus station for the 25-minute climb up switchback dirt roads to the ruins of Machu Picchu where we stayed at the Sanctuary Lodge. The hotel stands right at the entrance to the ruins. We climbed to the watchman's hut to get our first stunning view of this incredible place. The first Westerner in modern times to discover Machu Picchu was American explorer Hiram Bingham in July 1911. After a traditional offering to the gods of earth and air, we set off to explore the ruins perched in their eyrie high above the sacred river. Although there are many theories as to the uses of the various parts of the city, nobody knows for sure since it was abandoned centuries ago. Even the reasons for this are obscure. Maybe it was fear of approaching Spaniards, or, more likely, a new king had established a new capital elsewhere, as was the Inca custom. There is no other complete Inca settlement of this size and so well preserved in existence and no place can match its inspiring location. This time the lawns were being mowed by llamas. Tour guides give interesting descriptions of the site. A crew filming a beer commercial damaged this stone, which is probably a solar observatory. Near the wind shelters, people often make a wish against this rock. The traditional end of the Inca Trail is through the Sun Gate, but a recent landslide has made this approach impossible, and hikers have to come up on the bus. Did these steps go anywhere? As the sun began to set, we saw the farming terraces, the Temple of the Condor and the Fountain before it was time to leave. At the main gate, 
we couldn't resist one final look back at this unforgettable place.